Well, welcome ICI members to a special video presentation. We've got with us today, uh, Darcy Bullock from Purdue University. And Darcy, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about the JTRP just for uh, to set the stage. Hi, Richard, thank you. Um, yeah, so my name is Darcy Bullock. I'm a faculty member in the School of Civil Engineering at Purdue University. And I serve as the director of the Joint Transportation Research Program at Purdue University. And this is a long-standing partnership with the state of Indiana, looking for ways on how Purdue faculty, staff, and students can work with the state of Indiana to find ways to operate our state transportation system safer, cheaper, or more efficiently. So you do a lot of things with NDOT. You put on road school every year, which is a major undertaking. Yes, and uh, in addition to road school, um, we have over 100 active research projects with the state, looking at everything from piles, bridges, traffic signals, and, and more recently, uh, work zone safety and opportun identifying opportunities to reduce crashes in and around work zones. So great setup. That brings us to where we are today. Um, so Darcy, uh, I guess you'd say moderates what we call the governor's task force on uh, on work zone safety. It's been going on for, gosh, almost two years now. And uh, we're making great strides in that area, thanks to Darcy's leadership. And we've got a lot of things going on and some really interesting things that they're doing at the JTRP that I wanted Darcy, I thought was important to share with all of our members. So Darcy, kind of take us through this uh, presentation that you've you've put together. Sure, Richard, thank you. So uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna step through some slides here. Um, and the pivot point is really this photo right here. Um, there's a, a variety of uh, what we call Q trucks out there on the interstate that have been deployed in the past year in partnership with, with several of uh, uh, INDOT partners uh, that uh, are used to alert motorists uh, to upcoming queues and work zones. And uh, what I'm going to talk a little bit about is the data analytics behind this. And so before I do that, what I want to do is talk about uh, the, the motivation of the, um, the research in terms of the back queue crashes, the team effort that's gone into it, the workshop that we did with Richard at the State House on April 19th, and then give you some, uh, some example uh, performance measure dashboards and show you how this system that uh, the Indiana contractors are deploying out there on the interstate are having an impact and are making the roads safer. So before I jump into the details, this is a nationwide problem. And the most current data I have is from 2019. There's about 115,000 crashes in work zones. So those numbers aren't, so those are those are nationwide numbers. And I guess the, the, the comment there is uh, the problems that we have in Indiana, the challenges that we face in Indiana with work zone crashes are a national problem. But I would argue or suggest that the work that Indiana is doing to address this the rest of the country is looking at. And I think uh, Richard and all of his partners should be proud of that. And this, this graph up here, uh, this pie chart kind of articulates where we have focused our efforts. And so we work at, look at work zone crashes, but about half of our crashes in and around work zones are rear end crashes. And that's the, the focus of what we've been looking at. So we're gonna hear this term, hard breaking event as we go through this. I think that's an important thing for people to, to grasp. Outstanding point, uh, Richard. I'll dive into that a little bit, but just kind of the thumbnail overview of that is the insurance company for many years has looked at hard breaking events as a surrogate for predicting crash risk. So if we can reduce on the interstate what we would consider hard or breaking events that we would, would notice those are highly correlated with crashes. And I'll jump into a little bit of detail on that in a minute, but really good comment, Richard, to kind of provide a level set as we go through this, this set of slides. So what INDOT has established this concept of protect the queue. And the idea, this is a slide from a couple of years ago that INDOT prepared of a concept truck where 
if we could get a vehicle positioned upstream approximately a half mile or about 30 seconds before queued traffic on the interstate, that would increase the driver alertness and, and reduce the risk of crashes. So, for example, what we want drivers to be doing is to pass that queue truck and as they approach the queue, start gently braking right here. If we didn't have that vehicle up there and they get up really close and they're inattentive and then they're braking very, very hard, that's an indicator of crash risk. And that's uh, one of the data elements that we've been measuring with connected vehicle technology that I'll share a few details on in a minute. To kind of dive into a little bit of detail on how we went from this concept figure of a couple of years ago of a Q truck out there to reality, Richard and several of his team members were part of this April event with the commissioner down at the state house where several of the vendors brought their Q trucks down there. And you'll see uh, as I step into this a little bit, uh, there are several agencies that were part of this. There were several private sector partners. And if you look at that collection of Q trucks, there's three different vendors represented there. They all did things a little bit differently, but the general concept of them was to have some warning signs, some bright strobes, and a variable message sign. What I'm going to now share with you is how we went from that event down there to share with you some results of those deployments out on I-65 just north of Indianapolis in the greater Lebanon area. Just to give everybody a frame of reference, I think most of the constituents that are watching this video are well acquainted with the mile markers out there. But just to talk about the linear referencing system that I'll use on the figures, the graphs that I'm going to show you are tied to the mile marker posts along the interstate. So I'm showing 145.8 there. Or another way of looking at it, if we look at a little bit different perspective here, this is the 145.8, the 145.6. Those reference schemes that motorists use for reporting crashes are also uh, useful for us for characterizing the connected vehicle data. So what I'm gonna do now, Richard, is jump into a little bit of detail and try to unpack this dense slide that I prepared in April. And this is broadly called the, the heat map slide. And it's I'm gonna to jump to my next slide to kind of talk about this in detail. And I'm gonna pick one segment of this slide. And this is for I-65 South. I mentioned the mile markers. So 130, 132, 134, 136. So if you look in that vertical direction, those are the mileposts. And then if we look in the horizontal direction along here, this is the hours of the day in 24 hour format. And then I've color coded these figures where the higher speeds are lighter green, 55 to 64 is a little bit darker green, all the way down to the zero to 14, those are the purple numbers. So we can look at a glance and we can see what is that speed profile along the interstate from nominally mile marker 150 down to about 130. So that's about a 20 mile characterization of the interstate. And you can see that we had a work zone fairly active with some slow traffic up till about you know, 6 a.m. And then you can see some even slower traffic and, and queued traffic out there until maybe 8 a.m. I'm going to explain those purple lines in, in another slide that show the presence of the Q truck. Now I'm taking that one day, one direction graphic. And what you're seeing here is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Broadly speaking, green is good, uncongested traffic. The yellows, oranges, and purples, those are the slow traffic. And really our risk points are this back of Q, that boundary between the stop traffic and the traffic moving 55 miles an hour and above. Now, what we can do then is we can overlay onto this hard braking events. And all of this data is ingested by NDOT. The speed data comes in every one minute, so we can see these maps in real time. The hard braking comes in about twice a day, and we can see these hard braking events. So I'm gonna pick out a couple of these days to compare and contrast so you can kind of see how these work. Before I do that, I just want to toggle back and forth and I'm just going to show you these purple lines. So these purple lines, those are the position of the Q truck along I-65. And now I'm going to dive into a little bit more detail and just remind you that 
Heartbreaking events are correlated with crashes. And a study we did a couple of years ago on Indiana Highway showed that we had almost one crash per mile for every 147 heartbreaking events. So if I can reduce the heartbreaking events out there, I know I'm going to reduce the crashes out there. That's the key takeaway that you need to take away from this talk. And then I'm going to show you how we've reduced uh, heartbreaking events. As I look at this zoomed in plot of Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday in both directions, I'm going to just focus on two different examples. One is in the southbound direction, is one is in the northbound direction. And this was on the very early deployments, Richard. This was maybe the first couple of weeks we did the deployments out there. We went, in this case where we had a Q truck deployed, we had just two hard breaking events in five hours. This other location had queuing unrelated to the construction project, but it was that unexpected queuing. And if we look here at these red dots, we had, and count those up, we had nine hard, hard breaking events in three hours. So just compare on the left where we see the purple line, we had um, just two hard breaking events and we had nine. So there's more than a factor of four reduction in hard breaking when we had the Q truck out in that. The other thing I think as we we're dialing in this, we're still working closely with the contractors. I can't thank you enough, Richard, for bringing the contractors into this dialogue with the researchers. As we try to figure out what is best practice on how to manage the placement of those Q trucks out there? What's the appropriate offset? What's that appropriate operating protocol with one truck and two truck? So as we bring the telematics in there, we've had some after action reviews with our contractors so we can all learn together what is the best practice for deploying these resources. Because obviously, you know, we're putting our people on the road. So we're, we can, we're concerned about their safety, just as we're concerned about the safety of the, the driver and the other workers in the zone. Absolutely. It's a really good segue, Richard, on that. In addition to the visual warning, the other thing that we're doing is we're bringing these alerts into ways. And this is one that I just pulled Real quickly, this is from June 24th. We have this exact same technology in the Q trucks, but when we classify those Q trucks as an emergency response vehicle, much like a Hoosier, Hoosier helper. So when those vehicles are out there on the roadside uh, and you have a vehicle there, that same alert comes into Waze. Waze is our first frontier. Obviously we need to get it into all of the connected vehicle platforms, Apple and Google, but as long as we, we're, we're making progress with this, I'm, I'm thrilled on that. So this is probably the example that I'm the most excited to share with you, Richard, that I think is probably our best illustration of the impact that these Q trucks are having. having. So I'm gonna compare two days in May, May 26th and May 27th, two different locations on the interstate, the May 20, six event is in the you know 136 to 154 so that's down in the lebanon area and then the thursday uh, may 27 event is up a zone in uh, lafayette indiana nominally near the wabash river crossing if we look at the location on the 26th in the evening where we had the q truck present we had three hard breaking events if we look the next night on i-65 where we also had queuing just about the same time maybe even a little shorter duration we had 29 hard breaking events so if you think back i, I had that plot up there it's a, roughly 147 hard breaking events for a crash when i can see a reduction there and you know pick your number by a factor of nine. I'm really excited about the, the promise, this combined technology of visual alerting and injecting information into ways is going to have on the safety of our highways for both our maintenance workers, our contractors, and, and the motoring public. So explain what the Haas system is. And, and also, and when you're doing that, you can then uh, talk about how this data is even collected in the first place. Sure. So I think there's two questions here. So um, when we think about connected vehicle data, we need to think about a two way information flow from either the INDOT Hoosier helpers or a Q truck out there on the interstate. It's really important for us to inject or provide data to companies like Waze. There's a company that has emerged, it's called Haas Alert, 
that serves as a broker. And if we send the data to them, they're then gonna disseminate that out to multiple sources. So instead of having a, a contractor or INDOT have to have agreements with Waze and Google and Apple, the idea is that we can send it to one location and then it gets injected into the So map. inside the Hoosier helper vehicle and the Q-Truck vehicle, there's just a little a box, basically a transponder that then sends that information to the host alert people who then disseminate it to the different systems. That's that's exactly right. And uh, the it's a, it's a telematics device and typically it's wired into the strobes. So oh. um, when the strobes are off, we're not injecting an alert, but when we feel we need to have the strobes on out there, that's when it injects alert into the into the hospice. Thing. That's great. I didn't realize that. That's smart. So then the other the other going back even further then to the heat map, the, the hard breaking, where does all of that come from? So the other piece of this is the connected vehicles out there on the Indiana interstates and rough numbers, four to five percent of the vehicles traveling on our interstate highways in Indiana are providing anonymized connected vehicle data that INDOT ingests in real time. So within 60 seconds of a vehicle passing the interstate, we have anonymized speed data out there on the interstate. So we can down to, you know, you know, within a few hundred feet, construct these heat maps that then we, we color code by speed. So we don't know uh, individual vehicle identifications or speed, it's completely anonymous, but we have segment level ability to see what those speeds are. And what that allows us to do is understand where are the slowdowns, where are the queuing, and more importantly, Richard, where is the boundary between the stop traffic and the fast traffic? Because yeah. that's where the hazard is. And as I started out that talk with the pie chart, 50% of our crashes occur right there. So that's where we're intently focused. The other piece of information that we bring in is these anonymized hard breaking events. And so all of those red dots that you see there, Richard, those are individual vehicles. We don't know who they are or any, any identifying information about them, but we know at that location and at that time, approximately the nearest minute, we know where those hard breaking events. And when you see that cluster, Richard, right there at the back of the queue, mm -hmm. it's really, it's, 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 that's a real telling figure on why we see such a strong presence of back of queue or rear end collisions. That's where the driver inattention happens in work zones. We're not naive. We know that we're never gonna get every drunk driver or substance abuse driver or whatever else off the road and out of our zones. But we do know that there is opportunity within the distracted driving realm to reach people and we just need to find the way to do it you know we we worry about distraction but we have to acknowledge that distraction within the cab of a truck or the front seat of a car it's going to happen there's too much that's available to people now to distract them and so we've almost by these systems darcy kind of kind of embraced that we're acknowledging that you're doing these things. So we're gonna to try to meet you where you are. It's not enough to just put out signs. We all know that, that people get used to the signs, they get bored by the signs, they forget about the signs. But when you can couple those signs with something, you know, aural, something that comes in through the ear hole uh, that accompanies that, that's how we can reach the driver. And that's why getting into ways and then we as we continue to work on this, hopefully Apple, Google, whoever else, we can we can couple those things and really get to the driver in a more effective way. Absolutely. And I think, Richard, anything you can do or your constituents can do to help us on communicating that message at a state and national level, it that will be helpful for us to get additional partners on on board so we can start getting that that type of information out you know richard we really you know it's not without of the the realm of possibility um that the next generation of mutcd has got protocols on how we should be interfacing with these and so 
that's what we at Purdue hope to be working with you and your state constituents and your national constituents to start that dialogue on what's best practice. And I think the way you, you framed it is very well. How do we meet them in the middle at the technology they're using so that we all have a safer driving experience out there on the road? Well, we appreciate everything you're doing. It's the first step in a long path and appreciate you being a partner with us. Thank you, Richard.